Welcome to Boathouse, guys. Man, it gets better every week. God, it's so good to see this crowd here tonight. Um, <laughs> you know, we're talking about relationships. And um, if nothing else, I think a good relationship draws a crowd, right? And uh, so tonight, we're going to take, so we started off with Kelsey leading off, and we're talking about the ultimate relationship, right? Your relationship with Jesus. Because that's, at the end of this thing, guys, that's the only thing that really matters. If it doesn't matter, we might as well pack our junk up and head to the house. Um, So that's the very top, ultimate relationship, right? So coming down from that, last week, Clay talked about families. And we talked about what it is to, to have godly relationships inside your families. And what does that look like? So this week we're going to go one step removed from that and we're going to talk about what is it, what is it, does it look like to have godly friendships? So I was raised in Louisiana and for those of you that didn't know where the accent's coming from, that's what it is. If y'all can go ahead and stop guessing. Uh, so I was raised over in northeast Louisiana, a little town called Oak Grove, Louisiana. Actually 2,200 people, but go a suburb of that, a little town called Kilburn, Louisiana. I actually tell people that it's actually, you know, it's 300 people, 298 now, my brother and I left. And, uh, I mean, it's one of those towns, right, nobody, there's no stoplights in it, there's none of that action going on, it's, it's a one-horse town that got shot. It's a little bitty town, all right? So, uh, so when I left, I, I graduated with a whopping 24 people, and two of those guys graduated on attendance. Everybody tracking with me on that? I mean, it's a, it's a small town, right? My mom taught me in first grade. My dad, uh, my mom then taught me again in third grade. My dad taught me in sixth grade. My aunt was the other sixth grade teacher. It's a small town. My uncle taught me in the ninth grade. It's almost like Little House on the Prairie. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so I left that town, and I went to this town called Ruston. Man, I done grown up into the big city, right? I walked up in Louisiana Tech, and there's 12,000 people looking at me. From a town of 24, where they graduated class of 24, that's a little different, right? So I walked up in there and uh, <laughs> bobbled along through school a little bit and got to my junior year. I met this big old Cajun guy. He's 6'5", and he is the funniest character I have ever met in my entire life. His name is Sean, and I hope he watches this video tonight because he's going to get a good charge out of this when I throw him under the bus. So, so Sean was this guy that everybody wanted to hang around. He is absolutely hysterical. But I tell you what, he had a walk with Jesus that is impeccable. And he's one of those guys that when you meet him, you can't stop talking to him. And the reason that you can't stop talking to him, there's a couple of reasons. One is he's so big, right? He's 6'5", about 240, so you're looking at this big guy. And then the second part of it is he stutters. So now we got a Cajun that nobody can understand that stutters that is flipping hilarious, right? So I told him, I said, you know what? I'm going to take you to my house. I'm going to bring you home with me, and I'm going to show you to my family because he ain't never met nobody like you. Because in case you don't know, Louisiana is divided into two, two sections. There's North Louisiana where the rednecks are. There's a South Louisiana. That's where the Cajuns are, all right? He's from Booty, Louisiana. That's 30 miles southwest of New Orleans. He's down there. You look between his toes, he's got webbing. You know what I'm saying? Like a, he, was a, he went through the swamp. So anyway, I brought this guy home with me. And, uh, and I, so um, I brought him home because I wanted him to meet my entire family. It's Thanksgiving Day. And I told him, I, and I was always doing this kind of junk. I said, I want you to meet my family. And I said, I'm always kind of pulling stuff on my family. So I want you to meet them, and then here's what we're going to do. You just follow my lead, okay? (laughs) He's like, okay. So we walk up in the family, and everybody's sitting around the table. My grandparents, both of them are sitting around the table. And um, we're all sitting there, and we pull in, you know, and uh, I'm introducing Sean to everybody. And I said, listen, guys, before we begin this, I've got to tell you all something. So I was dating this young lady at the time, and y'all don't judge me on this. This, This is funny. So I said, uh, guys, I messed up. And my mom's like, what do you mean you messed up? I said, well, you know, my girlfriend, she's pregnant. And I said, I'm so torn up. I can't, I can't even finish this. <coughs> so I run out of the room and I said, Sean, would you finish talking to him? 
<laughs> and I am outside, and I am laying on the ground, and I'm howling. My mom's over there going, he ain't, mm, that ain't happened, that didn't happen. My grandmother's over going, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And I left that brother in there with his family, and he had never even met him, right? And he's like dying, dude. And I'm like, this is the kind of friend that you just want to throw right up and under the bus, right? <laughs> so y'all want to be my friend? Who wants to be my friend? <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Andrew. So tonight we're going to be talking about friendships. And um, for those of you that, um, that anybody in here got a friend? Y'all got friends? All right. Okay. You got one friend? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Josh said, I got one friend. All right. That's good. <laughs> All right. So do y'all know where the word friend actually came from? Anybody know that? So the word friend, if you actually went back to the original origin of the word, right, in the, in the root of it is a, is a word Arabic that means somebody that tells the truth. And that's sometimes, guys, that's hard, right? I mean, it's hard telling the truth. Anybody done an Enneagram? All right, so I'm an eight. And so sometimes I'll just, I'll just say it, right? And that, that doesn't come across very well sometimes. But by the same token, you also know where you stand with me. And I, I love people that will tell the truth. In order to be a good friend, you've got to be somebody that actually speaks truth. And um, so I, I looked up some information just about where we are today as a society, right? We just went through a global pandemic and uh, Cigna Health Insurance, y'all know what that is? So they actually did a loneliness index. And I, I wasn't even aware of this, but three in five Americans consider themselves lonely. And today, Gen Z and millennials are the loneliest generation that's walked on this planet. But this else was interesting. I'm in pharmaceutical sales. So this last little, this next part I, I thought was interesting. Loneliness is actually linked to stroke, increased strokes, increased heart attacks, increased autoimmune diseases, inflammation, cancer, depression, mortality. There's studies that actually say, in a Harvard study that actually looked at it and said loneliness is a greater cause for uh, heart attacks than heart disease. Wow. All right? You got my attention. But I don't really understand that because we've got, we've got everybody so plugged in to each other, right? I mean, heck, you look on your phone, dude, and you got Instagram, you got you know, Snapchat, you got I don't even know what else you got because that's all I really, that's the extent of my knowledge about all that. Yeah, so I'm not from that generation, but Facebook, whatever, right? So you're, you're the most connected, but yet we are the loneliest people. We just went through a global pandemic where everybody had to leave their jobs and go home, and I was like, man, maybe this is some hope for, for America, right? Or maybe some hope for people. Because now then you actually have to go home and communicate with people. Interesting. So even though we have all of those things, we're still lonely. Put my picture up there, uh, Braden, if you don't mind. Now, here's what else is interesting about the way God works. I didn't talk to Cody before this thing started tonight. I had no idea he was going to be talking about some yoke action. Anybody know what that is? Nobody was raised in a redneck family, so let me tell you all what that is. So my daddy had a, uh, had a yoke system, and he had two mules that he would put that yoke on them, and he would link them together, and he would actually plow his garden with that. Now, that's fine if you've got two mules linked together, right? But what happens if you link a donkey with an ox? Has anybody ever worked with a donkey? Don't, eat, don't answer that. <laughs> I'm not in real life. I'm talking about a donkey donkey. You know what I'm talking about? So here's, here's the deal about a donkey. What are they known as? The most stubborn animal alive, right? Here's the deal. So if that donkey decides he's going to stop and he's not going to plow this garden, that ox is going to have to drag his rear end down that row. Now here's what's going to happen. They're going to probably wind up in the ditch or you see that little separation between that yoke there? That's where a row is. So that's where your crop would be, right? And that one of them is going to tromp all over the man's garden, all right, and tear it up. But that yoke is supposed to be, you're supposed to be yoked together with something of the same. 
So normally you'd hook two, two ox together, right? Because that's what's really good for plowing and pulling stuff. Same thing happens, and typically you see the scripture thrown out there in the middle of a sermon, and it's typically during a wedding, right? You want to be yoked together. You want to have a, a mate that's a follower of Jesus. You want to have, you know, you want to be yoked, linked together with the sameness, right? Some, two people that are following Jesus and chasing hard. That's what you want. I want to put a little different spin on that tonight. What does it look like if you are yoked together, or if you're not yoked together, with the same? Two people that are just chasing Jesus like nobody's business. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 15. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? All right, Lane, that sounds great. Yeah, I hear you. You need to have good Christian friends. But I thought somewhere in the Bible, didn't it talk about, you know, like the Great Commission where you're supposed to go out and, you know, you're supposed to, you know, go. Jesus hung out with, you know, sinners and prostitutes. He hung out with, with all people that were lost, right? Here's what's interesting. I read a book over the break, and one of the things that was in that book, and it was really good, it said, that you know how much time Jesus spent with unbelievers? He spent 66% of his time with unbelievers i mean 66% of his time with his core group and then he spent 33% of his time with unbelievers i think there's something to that guys i bet you a coke right now if you took out your phone and and you looked at who you're talking to the most you look at who you're hanging out with the most you know what my prayer is for this talk tonight here's what my prayer is that some of you guys and girls will walk out there to this parking lot when we get through in a few minutes, and I hope you delete some contacts. You say, well, Lane, why would you do that? Why would I ask you to do that? 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Here's something my mom would say. My mom's got a lot of sayings, and you're going to hear some of them tonight. But it bears, it bears repeating, and I want you all to listen real close. Anybody in here have a dog? You ever had an outside dog? Yeah. You lay down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. So what does that mean? What does a flea do? Attaches to you, sucks the blood out of you, sucks the life out of you, causes diseases. I'm telling you right now, it's interesting what that scripture says, and it's Paul writing this. He says, do not be misled. Now, I thought about that, and I go, what does it mean? What is he talking about? Don't be misled. So, in other words, this is a little tricky, right? You say, bad company corrupts good character. Here's something I learned also over the break. I read this book by J.P., Jonathan Pecluda, who is a huge, I'm a big fan of J.P. and his ministry down in Waco. Um, one of the things he says, and, and I, I tr tr truly believe this, whoever your friends are is stronger than your convictions. You tell me who your top three friends are. I will tell you where you're going. My mom also had another saying that goes like this. She said, birds of a feather are going to flock together. Lane, you're leaving us, you're leaving this town of 24 people you graduated with, you're fixing to go into a place where you don't know anybody. A bunch of you guys, I've talked to you tonight, you've come in from San Antonio, you've come in from Houston, you've come in from wherever, Mount Pleasant, you've come in from all over East Texas and other states. You're here and you don't know anybody. I'm going to tell you right now, God's got you here for a reason tonight. Some of you, this is your chance to start over. You blew it in high school. You hung out with the wrong crowd. Maybe part of that's because you were in a small town like I was, and there wasn't a whole lot of people to hang out with. But maybe you chose to hang out with those people. Maybe you've been pretty good at making bad choices. Man, you, you're here tonight with a whole group of people that are, there's a ton of them in here that are chasing Jesus. And everybody came in here tonight for a different reason. 
And I don't know what that is. Somebody said, well, you got some hot guys here. Somebody said, oh, you got some cute girls here. Some of them said, you got neither. Not just kidding. That's not what they said. No, they actually came to hear Clay. And I get that. And I'm sorry. We'll have Clay up in a couple of weeks. But here's, here's what I do know. I do know that we serve a God that has given each of us second chances, me included. And he's got you here in Tyler, Texas for a season. I'm hoping it's for a long season. I'm hoping you keep coming back and just stay here at Boathouse. But also hope you get plugged in and you start to serve. Because there's a ton of gifts in this room. Man, we started out last year, and I think this is funny, Clay. We started out, and we had a, a YouTube video. That's what worship looked like last year in March, right? Everybody tracking with me on that? And, uh, but there's so much flipping talent right here, man. People are willing to serve. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do through Boathouse and through your friends. Because that's exactly how people are hearing about Boathouse. You're talking to your friends, and your friends are talking to friends, and everybody's coming. Your friends are stronger than your convictions. Let me give you an example of that. How many times, or think back with me. Now, some of you guys have made some bad choices. And uh, maybe the first time you underage drank or smoked. I'll just throw that out there. That's a pretty easy one. Smoke and drink, don't go out with girls that do, right? That's what mama would say. Or chew. When you were smoking and drinking, or whenever you were doing that kind of stuff, were you doing it by yourself? The first time you tried that, I would almost bet you you were with somebody. And you go, well, you knew better than doing it, but your friends are stronger than your character. And they will also push you one way or the other, right? I'll give you an example from my own life. <laughs> Eighth grade year, all right? I'm in the small town, right? And we all had four-wheelers. And uh, a bunch of guys that were older than me invited me and said, hey, Lane, let's go camping one night, all right? So I hopped on my four-wheeler, and man, across through the woods I went, went a few miles, and I met up with these guys. And uh, when I got there, they had the campfire going. It's about 8 o'clock at night, and uh, we were sitting around the fire, and uh, one of these upperclassmen looked, and uh, he pulled out from behind the log, he pulled out a Hustler magazine. Now, you may not know what that is. It's like a Playboy or whatever. I was in eighth grade, and I remember him pulling that out, and I can tell you to this day, and I'm 50 now, I can tell you what was on those pages. I tell you that to go, who you hang out with will determine a lot of things about you and the struggles you will have and the things that could determine your future. Hear me loud and clear. Your friends are stronger than your convictions. Okay? I'll give you another example. Check this out. Josh, come up here. Come right up there, buddy. No, just, sit, just sit right there. Sit right there. No, you, no, sit on the ground. Turn around and face me. Turn around and face me, Josh. Thank you, buddy. Man, this is a, this, we didn't practice this, obviously. So here I am right here above Josh, right? And I'm fixing to take Josh, and I'm going to pull Josh up. Because that's what you do, right, as a good Christian guy good Christian girl. That's why I'm hanging out with Josh. It's because I'm going to take Josh and I'm going to pull Josh up here with me because I am going to influence Josh. See, and I reach down here with all 230 pounds of myself and I'm thinking to pull him down. Does anybody see what's happening? Now that's a real life example of you going to pull him up, you going to pull her up, or is she going to pull you down? Let me tell you a thing about gravity. It's always a whole lot easier to go down than it is to come up. Can I get an amen on that? So here's the deal, guys. You're not hanging out with them people to bring them up. 
if you're still hanging out at the bar and you're still hanging out in areas that you know you shouldn't be, let me tell you what's not going to happen from somebody that went there as I went off to college. They are not going to hand you a microphone at that bar and say, hey, guys, why don't you, uh, why don't you just tell us what Jesus is doing in your life? They don't have that activity at the bar. They don't have that activity where people aren't chasing Jesus. Young people, hear me tonight. Your friends are stronger than your convictions, whatever they are. And if, you, if you're still toying around with, you know what, I'm going to pull him up here with me, you will not. You will be pulled down. <clears throat> Show me your five closest core friends, and I'll show you your, your destiny. If you lay down with hogs, <laughs> you're going to get stank on you. Anybody know who Solomon is? Anybody know who Solomon is or what he did, what he was known for? Solomon was the wisest guy that ever lived. Now, here's the deal. God was talking to Solomon. He's like, man, look, I will give you anything you want, anything. And, and you know what Solomon asked for? He asked for wisdom, which was the wisest response he could ever ask for. I remember being in the, also about the eighth grade. I was walking down the road, and my grandmother was walking with me. And she came up beside me, and she said, Lane, do you know what I'm praying for you? And I said, no, grandmother, what is it? My mom is what we called her. And I said, what is it? She said, I have prayed for you from the time that you were born that you would be full of wisdom and that you would make wise choices. You say, well, Lane, I don't have a memo. I don't have a, a godly mom and dad. We talked about relationships in our family last week. I don't have that. Let me tell you what you do have. I put that phone number up there on that board for a reason. Clay put that phone number up there on that board for a reason. You say, I ain't got nobody praying for me. That's a lie. Clay and I and Kelsey and I, we pray for you guys every week. If you need something, you pick up the phone and you text me and you say, Lane, I need to pray, man. I'm going through a struggle right now. i got friends that are pulling on me. Man, that's why we're here. That's why we come. That's why we've been coming for the last two years. That's why Boathouse exists, is to push you guys toward Jesus. And guess what? Every time I push you toward Jesus, you know what happens? I'm leaning into Jesus too. So don't ever think you're bothering me or bothering Clay or bothering Kelsey because that's what we want to do. I want to push you toward Jesus when the world's pushing you every which way but Jesus. So I got to thinking about that. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 20. Let's read this verse to you. You walk with the wise and you become wise. For a companion of fools suffer harms. Let me read that slow again. You walk with the wise, you become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. You know, I used to tell my mom, we, we joke, and then you'd have to meet my mom. She is, a, she is a true eight, man. She just says it like it is. Everybody loves my mom, probably because she's the best cook in North Louisiana. It's probably one reason. But um, one of the things that my mom would always, would always tell me, she said, Lane, I have to pray so hard for you. And I would say, you know what, Mom, we make a great pair. Because you know why? You need the practice, and I need the prayers. We're a great team. Yeah, she didn't think that was funny either. Um, but it's true. Um, that's the only thing that has sustained me and kept me alive. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, that's exactly what uh, we would like to do with you guys. And I want to pray for you. I want to see how can we pour into you. Um, you're the sum of your five closest friends. And here's what I think about that. Um, you say, well, wh what does that even mean? You're, you're the sum of my five closest friends. <laughs> and you say, well, how, how, how do my friends actually affect me? All right, here's a great example. You're hanging out with your friends. What are you guys talking about? What do you talk about? It's going to dictate what your conversation is. It's going to dictate, are you talking about Scripture? Are you talking about the Lord? Are you talking about what God's doing in your life? Are you talking about what your future's going to look like as you're serving and walking with Jesus? Or are you talking about, you know what, man, did you see her? Did you see that? Did you? Mm -mm -mm. Right? 
So you, you, you got that going on. You got this little gossipy thing going on. Or did you, did you see the way? Did you see the way he dressed? You see Matt the way he dresses. Did you see? Do you see that? Hmm. Or, I mean, what did your conversations even sound like? Maybe it's the fact that you're sitting there looking at Snapchat and looking at Instagram, and you're going, "Man, their life seems perfect. <laughs> I could just have that." If I could just make X amount of money, if I could just do this, and you got people around you going, mm, that's exactly right. I know, I know it's the same thing. Yep. Or your friend saying, you know what? Man, God's got this. God's got your future. Let me pour into you. Ephesians 4.29 says, don't let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And one day, guys, as a, as a follower of Jesus, we're going to have to give an account for the things that we've said. Now, God's grace covers that, and I'm thankful for that. But I also know this about my own life. If you could see the things that go through my mind some days, you wouldn't even be friends, you sure wouldn't be here listening to me but only by God's grace, okay? And that's the only reason any of us can stand, is only by God's grace. That same grace that covers all over those thoughts, the same grace that covers over your conversations, the same grace that anything you could have ever done or said or whatever, that's God's grace. It covers it. The cross was big enough to cover all of those things. But it sure would be nice, man, if you had people that were pushing in the same direction around your conversations. Here's something else, man. If you think about this, um, do you know your five closest friends are going to help determine who you marry? It's true. The people you hang out with, the, the guys and girls that you hang out with are going to help determine what your future is going to look like. Now, let me give you ladies a little bit of a tip and these guys a little bit of a tip. Let's just say that Somebody's dating, let's just say, I don't know, I ain't going to say that, I wouldn't say that. Let's just say that as you look at your boyfriend or your girlfriend, okay, and you say, well, you know, yes, he hangs out with idiots, or no, I mean, yes, she hangs out with idiots, but she, he's not, he's great. Wake up, he's an idiot. If he's hanging out with idiots, he's an idiot. All right? Let's just say it as it is. Because remember, your friends are determining who you are. They are. If he's hanging out with idiots, he's an idiot. That means, so let me tell you, fast forward this, what this is going to look like as you play this out. You go on and you get married. Y'all all probably raise children about the same time. Now then... Your friend, your kid's going to be hanging out with idiot kids. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Is everybody tracking with me on that? That's kind of an extreme case. But you see the reality of it. Take your rose-colored glasses off and go, man, is this guy, is he chasing Jesus? Is he leading me toward the cross? If he's not, drop his butt. Right? And the same thing with you girl, uh, guys. Man, if she's dragging you down and she's wanting you to do things that you don't want to do and you're not comfortable doing, drop her. And I mean like a hot tater, drop her. <laughs> mm -mm, not doing that. I ain't dating you. I'm not hanging out with that. Because the reality is, guys, you're in for a serious long, you say, well, he's not, he's not that bad, Lane. He's not that bad. She's not that bad. Let me tell you when she's going to become that bad, and he's going to become that bad. The instant you slide that ring on that finger, all them rose-colored things you've been looking at, gone. It's going to get ugly quick, all right? Because whatever little thing annoyed you now, it's going to go up by 10 million whenever you slide that ring on. It's going to determine who you marry, and it's also going to determine who you hang out with once you are married. Make the choice now, man. I'm not going to hang out with an idiot. I'm not going to date an idiot, and I'm not going to do any of that. And we're going to talk about what that looks like over the next uh, several weeks, all right? 
I'm pleading with you and begging with you, dude. Don't do that. <clears throat> it's also going to help determine what your calling is in life. That same guy that I mentioned earlier, Big Sean, um, we, can, we cannot talk for five years. It doesn't matter. When I pick up that phone with him, he's the first thing he's going to say is, what's God doing in your life? All right? That, that's, your, that's your inner circle. That's your squad. That's, your, that's the dude you want to do life with. And he's going to ask some of the hard questions. Where are you struggling? What do you, what's going on? What's your quiet time looking like? How much time are you spending in the Word? These are things that he's going to ask. Clay and I meet every Friday morning. Not only just to pray for you guys, we talk about a lot of different stuff. Part of that thing goes through confession. Part of that thing goes into, look, man, I, I, I dropped the ball last week. And it was. Last week I dropped the ball. It was just at a moment where I just went, Kee. But it's nice to have someone that's in your inner squad that you can come to, and they know all your warts and fleas, right? They know what you smell like. They know when you've been laying down with the hogs. Dude, if you don't have that, you got to find you a squad that's like that, okay? Because that's going to help determine what the rest of your life is fixing to look like. How do I know who my closest friends are, Wayne? All right. If they got all this kind of effect on me, who are we going to marry and who are we going to talk about and all that? So, so how do I know? How do I know? How do you choose? How do you know? First off, God knows, and he will lead you to people that are like-minded. I know that because I'm a little young guy that came from a little bit of town, and he led me to people that were chasing Jesus when I asked. If you're not asking, he's not asking. If you're not asking, he's not going to show you. So God say, God opened the door. He brought you to Boathouse. Man, if you don't know somebody that's chasing Jesus hard, come see me afterwards. I will bring you to some people that are chasing Jesus hard up in this house. And if you're looking for some good friends, there's some good friends around here, man. Here's some great examples from Scripture that I thought was pretty cool. Um, so um, put, 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 the, put the circles up there, Mr. Braden, if you don't mind. I'll show you this. I think it's pretty cool. So, and this is something you, you guys and girls need to really take home to heart. There's three circles up there. You got three circles on the one on the far outside out there. That's the people that you just kind of run into in the gym, right? That's the people that you run into maybe at the coffee shop. That's maybe they're lost. Who knows? We don't really know what they are, right? But it's people that you run into. It's not people that you hang out with. It's not people that you depend on for holding you accountable. It's not people that are just going to call you out on stuff. That's just people that you run into let's draw that thing down a little bit closer anybody remember who Jesus hung out with who was his squad the disciples right all right so how many of them was it there's 12 all right now here's what's interesting if you dig a little deeper into scripture what happened with that 12 did he always hang out with just the 12 or did he knock that thing down to these three right here right? Peter, James, and John. That was his squad. You know how I know it was his squad? Because there's some big events that took place inside the Bible that he grabbed his squad and said, let's go. A couple of those I just wanted to throw out there to you. You remember Jarius, right? The dude Jarius, and uh, he came up to Jesus, and he's like, hey, man, my daughter's dying. I need you to come, like, now, because I don't want my daughter to die. And so, so he did. I mean, you know, Jesus, but he was ministering to people all along the way. Well, about as he was traveling there, guy comes up to Jairus and he's like, hey, dude, ain't no use you coming. Uh, she died. She died. And so, you know, of course, everybody's weeping and moaning and all this sort of stuff, right? But Jesus goes on, not even phased. And he walks up there, and this is what he said. I want everybody out. And he said, Peter, James, and John, let's go. And that's who he took into the inner sanctum with him. And he said, all right, guys. And then he prayed over her. And the, she's, not, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And bam, 
she come back to life entered her and she gets up and rolls first example they're at the mount of transfiguration same thing all everybody's there right and he grabs his three boys peter james and john let's go peter makes some boneheaded statements when he gets up there but he's there and jesus looks over that and that's the same way we are right I see some boneheaded things sometimes, but God's grace covers that, thankfully. Speaking of boneheaded moves, I mean, you got Peter. He denied Christ three times. But you say, Lane, he's in the inner sanctum. How would you do that? How could you do that if you're one of Jesus' closest guys, right? How do you do what you do before we pick up that stone and throw it at Peter? But yet, somehow or another, Jesus still continues to use you if you ask him. That's what we call God's grace. And he extended to Peter because here's what I think is cool about this friendship. And y'all lean in on this. You know what's cool about it is? Because Jesus wasn't looking at his screw up. He was looking because he knew what Peter was going to become. And it grabs me because... I look out here at this crowd, and here's the deal. God's got a plan for you. And I'm looking at you going, man, God's got so much more to use you for. And you just ask him, God, what do you want me to do? He knew that whenever, after he had, had denied Christ, and then he came back and he said, Lord, three times he told him, Lord, you know I love you. Lord, you know I love you. Lord, you know I love you. And he knew that Peter was going to leave there and go over into Acts. And you know what the first thing he does? He says this sermon, and guess what happens? 3,000 people become Christians. And this is the guy that just denied Christ. I think about that, and I look at each one of you, and each one of you are coming from different places with a different set of friends and a different set of issues. But I'm here to tell you, young people, God loves you, and he wants to use you. You say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for hanging out with the wrong crowd. I'm sorry. I'm going to delete that flipping number and get rid of that. Now, you say, well, Lane, I don't know if I can do that. And here, I'm looking at everybody's face, and I can tell you there's people out here that are looking back at me and going, yeah, that's nice, Lane. I'm probably not going to do that. If you choose not to do that, let me tell you what's happening. This is what's going on. You have one foot right over here in the world. You have one foot right over here in the kingdom. Your friends who are lost are looking at you and they're going, what's the deal? You're no different than us. You're still hanging out with me. You're still gossiping with me. You're still comparing each other with me. You're still going to the bars with me. You're still doing worldly stuff. I don't see any different from you. So it's confusing. And, and it's not you're having zero impact on the kingdom. Zero. The second thing that Jesus was, the third thing that Jesus was doing when he's hanging out with him three guys, Jesus knows your future. And he knew what those guys' future was. You know who the first guy to die was of all the disciples? Of the twelve? James. Herod had him killed. Wasn't long right after that. Guess what happens to uh, Peter? Peter was so ashamed. I mean, well, he, he didn't want to die like Jesus did. So they took Peter, and they strung him up on a cross, and they flipped it upside down. And Peter said, I'm going to be buried upside down. John. It took John, and uh, they didn't kill him right off. They boiled him in a pot of oil. All of this for the gospel. Then they took him. And they stuck him on this island. They exiled him. You know what happened on that island? He didn't die. 
He actually wrote the book of Revelation. God knew, Jesus knew what their future was. And he knows what your future is. I'm here to tell you, people, he's got a plan for me, and I don't understand it. There is no way that I should be here. There's no way you should be where you are. It's only by God's grace. And your friends are going to help determine your destiny. You've got some choices tonight, guys, as the band comes back up. You've got some real choices to make. You say, Lane, um, I just don't think I can do that. I don't think I can cut loose of some of these guys that I've been hanging out with, some of these girls I've been hanging out with. I'm telling you right now, young people, if you don't, you are headed for a world of hurt, for years of hurt, for years of struggle. So I almost just want to implore you, when you leave here tonight and you get out to that parking lot, maybe you sit in your car and you're looking at that phone and your buddies have already texted you or said, hey, you know what, guys, hey, let's go out Thursday night. You got an option to make. You can go, you know what, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll join you. Or you'll go, you know what? I'm going to drive a stake in the ground tonight going, you know what? I'm going to sell out to Jesus. You will never regret it. I promise. Because the world's going to hit you with junk, dude. You are going to be hammered from your family, maybe from your job, maybe from kids that you might have in the future, relationships you have. You're going to be tried, tested, pulled sideways, you're going to go through some junk. I saw it this past year, even inside a boathouse. I was like, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Between the stuff that happened to my buddy Austin, I saw this junk happen with Braden. I've seen people lose family members. I'm telling you what, if you don't have a squad around you, if you don't have three or four close people that you can go, you know what, man, I am struggling. I need some prayer. I need some help. <laughs> Even Jesus had it. I mean, he had his squad. He had his three closest companions. So as I look at them circles up there, it's a little bitty circle there in the middle compared to the rest of them. Man, we live in a world that's filled with social media, that I feel like sometimes we have relationships that's just about as deep as a like on a dead gum Instagram. Where you just go, you don't even know, you don't even know some of the people that's on your your flipping Instagram list, your friends or whatever. You don't even know so many people that you're following. Maybe you need to go back there to your room when you get home and say, you know what, I'm going to delete a bunch of this junk. I'm tired of seeing how she dresses and how he is doing all this stuff. I, I don't even need to fill my mind with that anymore. Because here's what's happening. You go back and you look at that, and you go, you know what? I'm going to compare myself to that. That's not real. The junk is on there is not real. This stuff right here in this, in this, in this room and what's going to happen Monday through Saturday, that's real life. And you're going to need people around you that is chasing Jesus hard and pushing you to chase Jesus hard. All right? All of that begins, though, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you ain't got a relationship with Jesus, this talk on friend, you're like, I don't even, this doesn't even make sense. If you don't know what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've never taken, taken a look at your life and seen the sin that's inside of it, and you say, God, I repent of those things, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to follow you. The Bible says, we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Wages, we've earned it. I've earned death. You've earned it. But it's only by God's grace. Just like that Philippian jailer when he ran up to Paul and he said, what must I do to be saved? My boy said, repent and believe. It's that easy. 
We try to make it tough, but it's not. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from the things that, of this world and say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to sell out for you. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you so much for this time that we can look at your word. God, I thank you for friendships. God, I pray tonight, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior for the very first time, God, would they turn their lives over to you? God, maybe for the very first time they said, you know what, this, this makes sense. I understand what Elaine's talking about. I understand what it means that I am a sinner. And I've been part of the problem. I've been part of that, that group that's been saying, hey, man, let's go. Let's go out. Dear God, by God's grace, I pray that that person tonight would say, you know what, I'm leaving that behind and I'm going, I'm going to start chasing Jesus hard. I'm going to change my friends by God's grace. Dear God, I pray tonight that your spirit would fall on this room and that there would be several that would change their friends and change the direction and change their destiny tonight. And Jesus, I just ask tonight that your spirit would fall on this place there's one here tonight that doesn't know you that tonight would be the night that they would turn and come into salvation dear God help us to change our friends help us to change our playmates and change even or maybe even our playground and help us to walk after you God I ask all of these things in your precious and holy son in Jesus name